Good morning, or rather good day to America and Kalispera from Athens. Today is uh, CYA's Founders Remembrance Day. And, and when we think back at the beginning of this institution, we, um, uh, what I find remarkable is not that the, the founder had this idea of this uh, educational startup in the early 60s. Uh, after all, you know, Greece had, uh, it was the darling of the West of the United States. At that time, it had come out of this uh, uh, reconstruction, decade of reconstruction after the, the civil war against communism and uh, uh, the, the, the horrors of, Greek, uh, of uh, the Nazi occupation and before that, the victorious war against the Italians. So it, it was to be expected that a study abroad program would be asked for, would, uh, would, would appear. Well, but what is remarkable, I think, it was that it was founded uh, as an American nonprofit uh, corporation, thus escape, escaping the confines of the Greek educational system, uh, which is, um, it was interesting and it was uh, useful and organized uh, with exemplary governance structure and practice. Uh, what, what also I find remarkable is that, is that it was uh, pulled together in about a year. And uh, when you think of how communications were done in those days, when a, a letter just to travel from, a, from Greece to the United States and back uh, would take 15 days, uh, it, it's, uh, I must say, I, I, I find, I'm awed by that. I find this is a great achievement um, to, to get, uh, to start planning in 1961 and then in 1962 have uh, five, five uh, pioneering students here. Okay, um, it, it's a great pleasure to have with us today uh, uh, a professional in the field of education abroad and uh, uh, among the most well-known and influential international education leaders and that's uh, Dr. Brian Whalen. In his lecture titled, uh, The Metamorphosis of Education Abroad, Brian will give us a brief history of education abroad, discuss where things are, where things are going in the field, and we'll be answering the pertinent questions of how the COVID-19 pandemic will change this field. Uh, and what education abroad will look like in the near future. Uh, Brian Whalen is the executive director of the American International Recruitment Council, AIRC, a standards development organization founded in 2008 and focused solely on issues relating to international education, uh, international student recruitment. In the past, Brian has served as the president and CEO of the Forum on Education Abroad uh, for about a dozen years and has contributed to many higher education initiatives globally and has participated in national policy level meetings at the United States Department of State, United States Department of Education and the White House. I would only mention one very early initiative from, from his very uh, many um, occupations in the past, perhaps not the most important one, but one of significance to us here in Southern Europe. He was the founding uh, president of the Association of American College and University Programs in Italy, ACUPI, which is still going strong. Um, Brian is a widely published uh, personality uh, he um, was for 25 years the founding editor of Frontiers, the international journal of study abroad, the first uh, peer-reviewed international education journal. He received his uh, uh, BA in psychology at Marist College and his MA and PhD at the University of Dallas with psychology and literature specialization. He earned a certificate uh, in nonprofit finance and accounting from the University of Pennsylvania's Horton School. In, uh, 19, in 2019, rather, he uh, received a Centennial Medal from the Institute of International Education for his contributions to the field uh, of international education. Uh, 
He's also a recipient of the W. Lamar Cobb Lifetime Achievement Award from the Pennsylvania Council of International Education. Um, Brian is joined uh, today by Professor Hal Haskell, who will serve as the discussant uh, 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 of this uh, event. And I must say uh, a few words uh, about Hal. He, he's a classics professor and expert in Greek and Latin language and literature, a specialist in Aegean Bronze Age archaeology, and a member of the uh, Academic Advisory Roundtable of CYA, a recently uh, established forum for dialogue, which brings study abroad professionals and, uh, uh, and faculty uh, from various partner schools of CYA together with our own faculty and staff in structured discussions. Hal Haskell received his MA and his PhD in classics uh, from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and his BA from Haverford College. Uh, he first visited Greece, I think in 71 as an undergraduate, fueling his lifelong passion for Greece uh, and education abroad. And after th a three year position at the American School of Classical Studies, he taught at the um, University of Memphis and later at, the, at Southwestern University until his retirement recently in 2020. He has excavated in Greece and Turkey and is widely published uh, in North America and European journals and is the lead author of a book in late Bronze Age olive oil and wine exchange within the Aegean and beyond. We had the pleasure to have Hal and his uh, spouse, uh, Dr. Pam Haskell, teach at CYA in the past. Gentlemen, uh, thank you both for accepting our invitation to be part of this special lecture today. Uh, commemorating our founder is Mini Philaktopoulou. Uh, before I pass the floor to Hal, may I say that uh, uh, this is being recorded and the discussion will be saved for future reference uh, archived by our librarian. So anybody who doesn't want to be recorded, please kindly turn off your video cameras. Thank you very much, uh, Hal. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alexis. I'm delighted to participate in this CYA Founders uh, remote lectures uh, program today. If you'll permit a quick personal observation, my spouse, Pam, and, and Alexis just mentioned her, and I first became acquainted with, acquainted with CYA in the late 1970s, when Pam taught some courses for CYA. And I remember vividly a garden party back then at the Cafisia house, hosted by the gracious visionary, Mrs. Phil. We remain great fans of CYA, even more so now. CYA, as with earlier crises, has turned the COVID challenge on its ear, converting it into an opportunity to think, rethink creatively about how one might transform for the better higher education in general, international education in particular, not only for the relatively short-term COVID crisis period, but also moving forward. As Alexis notes uh, in a recent issue of Greek Business File, CYA aimed to enable students to immerse themselves into another culture, open a window, so to speak, to a world outside America, learn about Greece and its society by spending a year studying in Athens. But one of the many opportunities Pam and I have had to observe this in action was fairly recently when we tagged along for a class session held on the streets of Kaisariani, an area with a tradition of resistance. The instructor integ integrated various disciplinary perspectives, architecture, both public and private. And of course, there are the bullet holes from World War II, uh, German weapons still visible, but also history, political science. Kaisarini is a part of Athens where the other, the marginalized have lived, a neighborhood as most of you know, that had been inhabited originally by Greeks through forced resettlement from Asia Minor. This class certainly was deeply intercultural, interdisciplinary, and certainly contributed to the transformative experience that CYA students enjoy. That is to say, education abroad at its very best. But with that, let us move to our speaker. 
First, some housekeeping notes. Uh, throughout the discussion, you can submit your questions using the chat box on the bottom of your Zoom screen. As soon as Dr. Whalen concludes his presentation, we will get to as many questions as we can. So I'd like to pass the mic now to Dr. Whalen for his presentation titled, The Metamorphoses of Education Abroad. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hal. And thank you, Alexis, for that wonderful introduction. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, thank you very much to CYA for inviting me to be part of your Founders Remembrance Day celebration to share some thoughts about the history and the future of education abroad. I know that CYA is a very special education community, and I couldn't be happier to be part of this celebratory event with you. In preparing for this talk, I took inspiration from Ovid's magnus opus, The Metamorphoses, an epic poem that presents transformations in Greek and Roman history. In this much brief, briefer presentation, I will address past transformations of education abroad as a field, how it is changing during this pandemic and how it is likely to change in the future. Along the way, we'll also have something to say about how education abroad can transform students. Let's begin by noting that in early America, travel abroad for education was commonplace. Scores of American students traveled overseas for specialized study at the graduate level before the United States developed research universities. A representative example was Benjamin Rush, a founding father, revolutionary thinker, prominent and influential physician, father of the field of psychiatry and founder of Dickinson College. After graduating from Princeton in 1760, Rush studied at the University of Edinburgh for his medical education and discovered the benefits of living and learning in another part of the world. We might call Rush the first study abroad advisor. After returning to the US, he wrote that every native of Philadelphia should be sent abroad for a few years, if only to teach him to prize his native country above all places on earth. He also suggested that students should go abroad to bring back knowledge that would be beneficial to the United States. It wasn't until more than a century later that study abroad became an organized activity. Indiana University had one of the first, if not the first, formal study abroad programs in the United States beginning in 1880. These summer tramps were co-educational trips through Europe for Indiana University students and faculty that combined educational and research opportunities with tourism. This program, I think, was most likely named after Mark Twain's novel, A Tramp Abroad, which was published in 1880 as a sequel to his Innocence Abroad. In 1885, the summer tramp countries included Norway, Switzerland, Scotland, Germany, Italy, France, and England. And note if you can on the description, although it's hard to read on the slide, these trips required a lot of walking. The slide on the left mentions a walk of 250 miles total. Imagine trying to do that today with students, <laughs> it might be difficult. Also in the 19th century, the seeds were planted for what would become in the 20th century, a more formal activity of US study abroad, volunteering abroad. The Student Volunteer Movement for Foreign Missions was an organization founded in 1886 that sought to recruit college and university students in the United States for missionary service abroad. The first unofficial group of student volunteers for foreign missions was formed in 1888 at Princeton College. Five students drew up and signed a declaration of purpose which read, we, the undersigned, declare ourselves willing and desirous, God permitting, to go to the unevangelized portions of the world. The non-denominational student volunteer movement was singularly successful in promoting its vision, encapsulated by its watchword, the evangelization of the world in this generation. These missionary students over time engaged also in academic work and research while abroad. And interestingly, investigations on the ground by curious and academically inclined missionaries contributed to the development of academic disciplines, such as anthropology, linguistics, comparative religions, and even the natural sciences. 
In his history, Hoffa writes that the above models of formal and informal study of abroad represent the precedence of the study abroad model that we know today. Perhaps important to mention here too, as Hoffa points out, missionary connections led to the foundings of the American College of Beirut in 1862 and the American University of Cairo in 1919. After these early forms of education abroad, we begin to see a new model develop right after World War I. Hoffa documents that in 1923, the University of Delaware initiated a year-long program in France for French language students. Smith College initiated a similar program in Paris in 1925, while Rosary College initiated one in Switzerland. These pioneering programs led to the emergence of three distinct study abroad program designs still used today, the junior year abroad, the faculty led program and the summer study abroad program. But the dominant model during this period and the name by which it was known was junior year abroad. During which students would spend their third year of college to study language and culture abroad. This model we well recognize as a primary paradigm that began, became the norm for study abroad up until about 25 years ago. During this period of extreme global conflict, book ended by two world wars, study abroad was offering the hope of helping to resolve conflict. In his 2015 dissertation on US education abroad, Eduardo Contreras offers this explanation, quote, Corporate and cultural internationalism informed the belief that study abroad could mitigate world conflict and ease transnational flows of capital for the benefit of the United States. On the one hand, cultural internationalists promoted the idea that by spending time in other cultures, individuals would gain deeper cultural awareness of each other in ways that would stimulate mutual understanding and international harmony. Corporate internationalists were also interested in international cohesiveness, but were motivated by a desire by peaceful relations between nations to stimulate global economic partnerships. These ideas, says Contreras, of internationalism began to circulate with more intensity in the aftermath of the Great War as internationalists sought peaceful ways for individuals to overcome conflicts between nations. According to Contreras, these early programs had another goal in mind, the advancement of students' professional skills, especially the professional goals of male students. However, the programs attracted mostly women, many of whom went on to become teachers, and they experienced other benefits of the programs. Contreras says, the rhetoric used to promote these early programs often emphasized academic and professional aims yet the student participants would return to the United States extolling the developmental and cross-national benefits of their overseas experiences. Women made up 75% of participants on the University of Delaware study abroad programs in the 1920s and 30s. And the university had to appoint new deans of women to support the women while abroad. And as we know, the percentage of women who participate in education abroad has remained significantly higher than men. The ratio of 65% women to 35% men has been consistent now for at least the past 40 years. The next period of development occurred roughly after World War II up until the mid to late 1960s. Hoffa describes this period is one in which an infrastructure for education abroad was developed at US colleges and universities, as well as through a growing number of independent program provider organizations like CYA. Contreras describes this as a period of institutionalization and attempts at standardization, a time when education abroad became more commonplace and accepted. As an example of how commonplace study abroad was becoming, Vice President Lyndon Johnson wrote in the introduction to the 1962-63 edition of A Guide to Study Abroad, quote, as I look ahead to the challenges of confronting America, I would strongly urge our qualified young men and women to consider the prospect of some study abroad, unquote. 
Contreras argues that during this time, a burgeoning interest in expanding the international dimension of US higher education, combined with growing student demand for travel, fueled a boom in overseas studies programs of different types and lengths. Study abroad became part of larger discussions about expanding the international dimension of US higher education generally. And the role of the American student as a global ambassador became an important but contentious aspect of study abroad. In this period, many proponents focused on the mechanisms for administering programs, and they attempted to establish ways to legitimize study abroad that emphasized high academic standards, US institutional control, and selectivity of students. After this period, roughly over the past 50 years now, we have seen a continued expansion of education abroad in several respects. There has been a steady increase in student numbers, student per, students uh, participating in study abroad. More diverse program locations, the development of new types of program models, greater integration of education abroad into the campus curriculum, a much greater degree of faculty involvement and a concerted effort to assess and document student learning outcomes. Education abroad became the accepted term for the field, replacing study abroad as a way of acknowledging the many types of out of class abroad experiences that had developed, such as internships, work experiences, field work, and volunteer work. This broader term, education abroad, was promoted by the Association of International Educators, NAFSA, with the publication in 1993 of the Guide to Education Abroad for Advisors and Administrators, which had formerly been known as the Guide to Study Abroad. Something else of importance happened in the last decade of the 20th century, a, recogni a recognition that in the attempt to raise the bar on the academic rigor of education abroad, to set requirements and standards for participation, study abroad became so selective as to develop an experience reserved only for a certain type of student. As Contreras explains, prior to the end of the 20th century, reform-minded advocates of overseas study also began to recommend increased participation in study abroad for students of various academic majors and different ethnic, racial, and soci socioeconomic backgrounds. In many ways, these reformers had to counteract the unintended consequences of their peers, attempts at standardization in previous decades. Many of the principles of selectivity that proponents established in the 1960s had established a pattern of elitism in study abroad that worked against the new principles of inclusivity that reformers introduced in the late 20th century from Contreras's history. Finally, one more point about the more recent history of education abroad in the last uh, 20 years now. A major influence on education abroad has been higher education's focus on the assessment of student and program outcomes. Institutions and programs have focused on defining the mission and the goals for education abroad in order to establish its value and its relevance. We've seen dozens and dozens of different approaches to this effort. Some of these have focused on promoting how students going abroad become global citizens. Other fo others focus on skills that students may achieve such as intercultural or cross-cultural communication, foreign language or interpersonal skills. Other programs tout how students develop critical knowledge about the world or specific regions, countries and cultures. And still other goals relate to personal growth and development how students become more resilient, mature, and achieve higher self-esteem. In short, education abroad has become more precise about what the abroad experience means for students. At the same time, it has often seemed that we've placed too many expectations on education abroad to deliver too many outcomes for students. And I'd like to refer you at this point uh, to these histories that I've cited Bill Hoff has uh, two volumes of the history of study abroad. The second one, an edited volume. The first one he authored, um, the US study abroad beginnings to 1965. Second volume, a series of chapters covering different topics of the history of 
study abroad from 1965 to 2010. And then the more recent uh, Harvard University dissertation by Eduardo Contreras. Really excellent books here for you to look at more closely if you'd like. So now I'd like to turn to the impact of the pandemic and the future of education abroad. First, let's note that even before the pandemic, higher education was facing serious challenges, including a growing public skepticism over whether its escalating price is in line with what it delivers. Institutions struggled to explain the reason for prices escalating, as well as how to demonstrate the value and relevance of their degree programs and academic offerings. Now, during this pan pandemic with a strained economy, and when students have become accustomed to online learning, this skepticism is even more pronounced. Education abroad exists in this environment and its post-pandemic return will bring a heightened scrutiny, scrutiny about its value and its relevance. Therefore, the education abroad field needs to embrace change and develop new forms for demonstrating its value and relevance for students, for institutions, our nations, and our world. It may be difficult for us to see, but I believe the pandemic has shed a new light on education abroad that can lead to important transformations of the field. The pandemic has given us at least three concrete ways that education abroad can reinvent its rationale and structure and assert a new value and relevance for our time. Let's call these lessons learned from the pandemic or pathways forward, if you'd like. First, Online learning can support and enhance education abroad. Over the past year, we've all become much more comfortable using a variety of technology to enhance online teaching and learning, including in education abroad. Second, we have seen how we need to address global challenges through a multidisciplinary approach and with global cooperation. And then third, we've learned students are flexible, resilient, and adapt to situations in order to pursue their educational plans and pathways. They found ways to be active agents of their education and how to learn and grow from the experience. So I'd like to describe each of these to you and how I believe education abroad will be shaped by these uh, different uh, pathways forward. First, online learning. Online meetings, of course, have become a part of our everyday lives. It's become the way that we stay connected to family and friends, and for many of us, how we're able to continue to work. In the education abroad context, something happened that we thought unthinkable before the pandemic. Education abroad taking place sometimes without physically crossing a national border or without uh, moving from in front of your computer screen. The past year has been an experiment in offering education abroad online through a variety of means. We've seen virtual internships, students interning with uh, uh, entities overseas located in, in different uh, countries, different cities around the world while being based in the United States. Online courses taught by faculty from abroad, virtual walking tours and excursions, and I understand the new 30 students at CYA who just arrived earlier this week uh, took part in a wonderful excursion today exploring Athens online led by a CYA professor. Also collaborative online learning which links up uh, classrooms across borders uh, and offers team taught courses, faculty from uh, different universities located in different countries cooperating to offer a team taught course with different students participating. And also online seminars and lectures. And I applaud CYA for uh, very quickly offering very important content online uh, to its community uh, when the pandemic hit. I've been able to uh, take part in a few of those and really appreciate uh, what CYA has been able to offer. These online methods will not simply disappear but I believe they'll be incorporated into our education abroad architecture going forward. Online enhancement of education abroad has the potential to increase access to a global experience for more students, achieve greater diversity in participants and make education abroad more inclusive. 
We are likely to see, for example, virtual education abroad experiences being offered as a first step towards uh, in-person education abroad experiences. We know that for a wide variety of reasons, most students do not study abroad. The overwhelming uh, majority of US students do not take, place, uh, take part in a study abroad experience. It's anywhere from three to 5% of students that would normally study abroad in a given year. So we have very many students who don't have this experience available. A virtual option uh, can reach these students. It may be that for some students, online formats for education abroad will be a useful part of their learning. And this type of enhancement can be part of a strategy of global learning for all on a campus. And this global learning for all has become uh, a very hot topic here in the United States is an initiative led by the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And there's a much discussion about how to make uh, international education and education abroad more available to students without having the students need to leave the campus. There is a danger here, however. Institutions need to guard against this de devolving into a situation where those with enough funds go abroad and those without enough funds stay home. The challenge for institutions will be how to promote equitable participation based on curriculum and not based solely on financial resources. So secondly, let's talk about globe education or education for the globe. This is the second lesson or pathway that the pandemic has provided to education abroad. The monumental problems we are called urgently to address the pandemic, racial injustices, migration and immigration issues, rising nationalism, social and political divisions and climate change, among others, make this an opportune moment for education abroad to become more relevant and valuable. These problems cross borders and boundaries. Education abroad can contribute to addressing them by fostering in students a profound and lasting sense of being part of a global we. Educating students for the global we challenges fixed notions of place, time, and identity. Developing the whole student in ways that go beyond what we can provide in the traditional classroom. In this sense, education abroad around the globe could become education about and for the globe to benefit the greater global good. Mediated online experiences and learning have the potential to connect students globally and foster this understanding by greatly increasing the reach of education abroad learning. To accomplish this, education abroad needs to be more inclusive in two ways. First, it should make this type of learning more accessible to a greater number and range of participants. An impactful global we needs a critical mass of people. Engaging students through online education abroad makes this imaginable. Second, in terms of the mission and purpose of education abroad, we need to include the entire planet as a participant and beneficiary of education abroad. The pedagogical framework for examining our global challenges must be a cross-disciplinary transnational one. Education abroad has always lent itself to a multidisciplinary approach, but rarely have programs tried to develop a truly global cross-disciplinary program that incorporates perspectives from around the world. Critical global challenges do not fall neatly into strict disciplinary categories and are best viewed through global cross-disciplinary lenses. Online education can help institutions to incorporate diverse approaches to greatly enhance learning. Online learning opens many more possibilities for collaborations that can include faculty expertise and perspectives from around the world. Enacting this vibrant exchange of global cross-disciplinarity would mean in practical terms that education abroad programs cooperate across borders to offer courses. For example, can we imagine some designated global courses offered at CYA? from which students would choose added to the menu of other courses. These global courses could be team taught by faculty from a few different study abroad programs and include cohorts of students from those programs. Global themes such as climate change, migration and nationalism could be studied fruitfully through an exchange of faculty perspectives, as well as the sharing of student observations and experiences in different global locations. 
And the third pathway forward I call education abroad as an opportunity to transform the self. As mentioned, the pandemic has impacted greatly individual students in direct and dramatic ways. Students have had to be resilient and flexible in the face of incredibly challenging and evolving situations. Many have seen their academic and professional plans interrupted and have been forced to rely on their motivation, creativity, and ability to adapt to keep their academic programs on track. This situation, I believe, will accel accelerate a shift to a more personal-based, student-centered paradigm for higher education and for education abroad. In this new paradigm, students will be much more active in shaping their own unique individual pathways made up of learning experiences based on their goals, needs, and interests, and that are available when and where they need them. Students will increasingly help to shape their learning based on their interests, goals, and abilities. This learner-centered approach will provide students with a greater sense of ownership for their learning and result in a personal and compelling educational story that is uniquely theirs. Students will increasingly need and want education abroad to help develop specific knowledge and skills for personal and career advancement. In order to meet this need, education abroad will need to reinvent its structure and method of delivery. The idea of a set program that students funnel into will be radically altered in favor of a model in which students are actively involved in constructing a personalized program for themselves. While the supporting program infrastructure will remain in place, a student will select from a menu of opportunities for engagement and learning that he or she can create to, to form a program unique to them. Program sponsors will offer learning activities that have been demonstrated to help participants advance specific learning goals, skills, and interests. For example, achieving a proficiency level in intercultural communication might require participants to attend certain classes, meet regularly with a local language partner, meet with a local family sponsor, participate in an internship, et cetera. This will not be simply about students choosing to pursue a hodgepodge of discrete activities, rather a collection of experiences and activities will be associated with the development of specific knowledge and skills that the students have identified as important to them. Now on a deeper level, education abroad will continue to promise self-transformation. For all of us living in this increasingly globalized world, we are confronted continuously with challenges both to our sense of self and to our sense of place. The psychological stress caused by globalization is perhaps most acute during the education abroad experience when one's identity and one's sense of place in the world are challenged. Yet it is precisely during these sojourns that the opportunities to transform oneself are most ripe. Transcending the boundaries of self, culture, and society through education abroad can lead to the discovery that self and place are transient, relative, and more in flux than they seem to be prior to departing on one study abroad program. The realization that global forces and interactions shape personal identities and localities while stressful and terrifying for some, lead to an opportunity. It can be liberating. And herein lies the, uh, the paradox of education abroad. Beyond the experience of the stress of globalization lies the possibility to discover a newfound freedom to transform ourselves, to refashion who we are and where and how we belong in the world. How can we move beyond the stress of globalization to facilitate these opportunities for students? At a minimum, we ought to focus more on the opportunities for and facilitation of self-transformation through education abroad. Self-transformation and defining one's place in the world are the deep value-added dimensions of education abroad that can be addressed explicitly in our education abroad curricula and co-curricula as well as in student development approaches, programs, and services. Encouraging students through multiple means to reflect upon their sense of self and place and to engage in new roles that challenge them will help students to achieve the deepest goals of education abroad, keep them in step with our global age, and add that important value and relevance to education abroad. In conclusion, in the opening line of the Metamorphoses, Ovid writes, 
I want to speak about bodies changed into new forms. And he then describes how the chaos that ruled the universe metamorphosed into the earth as people know it. The next metamorphosis of education abroad will hold the dual promise of transforming the globe while transforming individual students' lives. This will be the focus and the promise of education abroad. And our future, I think, depends on our success. In closing, let me say that I believe the vision of Ismene Philotopoulos was among many things, a vision of transforming lives. CYA alumni are testimony to the power of this opportunity and thousands of those students, including my son, Gus, a 2011-12 student at CYA pictured here, uh, have experienced. So you can see, I have personal documentation of how CYA transforms lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. That was an absolutely wonderful um, historical sketch and um, a, a we got a nice sense of where international education can go moving forward. I like very much the way you um, talked about some general issues in higher education in particular that are accelerated by the COVID crisis that apply not only to international education, but of course, higher education here in the state. So it, it all meshed really, really quite nicely. Um, please out there, put questions in the chat space. I'll, I'll make I'll make a uh, ask a question myself. One, I want to do questions myself. But any questions you all have out there, please type them in the chat space, and I'll repeat them. Um, I very much like the the idea of global learning for all. Um, and again, that's a principle that applies throughout higher education. That is higher learning for all, and it's one of the great issues now. If we look at um, some of the data from last fall and now in the spring, we know, um, and again, this driven by the COVID crisis, that applications initially were down um, across the country. Now they're up um, closer to normal levels, um, in part because I think application deadlines were, were later, but there's a disturbing trend, and that is the elite institutions are doing quite well, and the less elite institutions not as well. So we have the risk of, of um, again, sort of separating the haves and the have-nots, the elites, the non-elites, and you, you touched on, on that really, really quite nicely as it relates to international education. So the idea of global learning for all uh, really resonates. Um, but uh, my own institution yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to, to go through the whole list, my own institution yesterday put out a list of um, remote programs, virtual programs, if you will, that students can uh, participate in, in order to satisfy the intercultural learning experience requirement. Um, and I've looked at a few of them um, and they seem to, to fall in for the most part, not all in college here in Athens would uh, really stand outside the, what I'm seeing as, as the pattern here, but they seem to fall into two groups. One are the traditional sort of language kinds of programs where you have somebody sitting in France teaching kids how to speak French and that's all very good. Um, and the way some of the syllabi are set up, I don't see a whole lot of difference between that French national sitting in Paris or in Chicago. Um, so, you know, there's a, a bit of a, um, perhaps a disconnect there. But the other trend I'm seeing is, um, and this fits in with higher education in general, and that is, and you touched on this, on this as well, credential courses, that is boot camps. Um, students are rethinking whether the four year undergraduate experience is worth the expense. Um, and so a lot of these programs abroad are internships or various other things so that you can learn how to work within an international company. And that's all to the good, but very specialized, not the broader kind of approach the college year um, offers. So, uh, Brian, what's your response to that? These, these very sort of specialized trends that, and perhaps I'm misreading the data, but these very specialized kind of programs, um, they're all good. And, you, and you've talked about them, but... Um, I think college here in Athens really has a value added kind of, uh, kind of approach. We'll stop there. Yeah, thank you for that question, Hal. And uh, this gives me an opportunity to mention something which I didn't have time to go into, but what I see happening uh, here in the United States and globally is that we do have many, many more options for not only students during college age, but 
working adults, uh, people throughout their lives to take part in specific kinds of programs that offer credentials, certification. And, and that certifies that you have a certain knowledge, a certain skill that you've developed. Uh, and those are being offered in many different forms, uh, online uh, by private companies that might hire workers and wanna train them uh, mm -hmm. to their specification. Uh, Google is a good example of that. There are many others. Uh, I had a conversation recently with a colleague who is in the leadership of the Association of Registrars. And many of us know the Registrar's Office, right? We've, we've dealt with Registrar's Offices on our campuses. They tend to be very conservative, uh, very much uh, safeguarding uh, all credentialing and grading and, and all of that is very important work. And I asked this person what the future was in the registrar's world and in credentialing. And she responded by saying that the future is that students will safeguard their credentials. They will, they will archive and keep track of their credentials. The credentials won't sit at different institutions. And, and this is in response to the fact that students, all of us are going to move into a world where we accumulate our educational experiences, our different credentials in a wider variety of ways and a wider array of opportunities as we go through life, applying them to work, applying them uh, to different aspects of, of how we live. That, that's the future. And so what will happen is there will be companies and there already are private companies that will certify credentials and house them for individuals. And this will allow for uh, also a multitude of ways to document uh, one's learning too. So it opens up all kinds of possibilities. You can imagine portfolios and examples of work that traditionally don't make its way into a transcript that, that we're used to seeing you know, from a campus. So the, the world is definitely moving in this direction. What does it mean for education abroad and for uh, a program like CYA? I think it offers opportunities uh, you know, to think about ways of building on specific strengths, keeping the core program intact, which is so successful and impactful, but also looking for other opportunities. Um, for example, hosting uh, corporate groups or adults who are looking for uh, different uh, experiences that can enhance their knowledge and, and uh, help to certify a certain expertise. Uh, so I think uh, with every uh, development like this, sometimes we look at it as maybe limiting or being a threat, but there's also the side that presents opportunities to us. And I, I see it that way. Thank you. Um, looking at the chat space, Michael Wolf writes, narrative has shifted from global good, the Fulbright vision, to one of personal benefit. Education abroad is positioned as a way to create another elite. Those who study abroad are distinguished from the lumpen rest. Response oh. to that. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Michael. Um, and glad you're, you're here with us. I, you know, emphasize this a notion of the global we and being part of this global community. And I have been struck by how during the pandemic, we have been sensitized to a greater degree about our global challenges. You know, first it was maybe looking at the environment. I, I remember the photos and I know Michael and I both lived in Padova, Italy near Venice at one time and uh, we're, we're very, uh, experience walking the, along the canals in Venice, those canals were uh, crystal clear for the first time in a long, long time. And, and you saw that because uh, we, there was less tourism, less travel. And so we were alerted to the fact that our, our planet is fragile. And if we can have an impact, this was an unintended consequence perhaps of the pandemic, but together, acting together, we can impact our globe. So I wanted to emphasize this new opportunity for education abroad uh, to facilitate this kind of global connectedness. But it has to be a, a effort that is very inclusive, that's made up of diverse people, diverse students, not only from the US, but whatever we can do to incorporate exchanges and working across borders with professors and students from other countries. 
that's the idea there. At the same time, I do think we have this opportunity to make this a more personalized kind of experience for students as well. And that doesn't need to be a selfish kind of experience. You know, part of that is to develop uh, empathy uh, and the concern about the globe and a way of helping other people and um, benefiting the planet and so on. So I, th I think they, they can go together, those two sides of a coin, let's call them. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas Hatsopoulos writes, while I can see the benefits of doing virtual learning in a limited basis in study abroad, doesn't it really defeat the essence of study abroad, which means really being physically immersed in a culture? And I sort of appreciate that. It's, it's sort of one of the you know, fundamental questions about um, doing this kind of thing across distance. Yeah, well, at heart, I, I, I'm, I believe that. I mean, there's no substitute for the in-person kind of education abroad experience, uh, that's true. But I think we can consider a spectrum uh, of different types of experiences that are aligned with uh, specific kinds of outcomes. You know, uh, I've always been troubled by the claims that, you know, go abroad for four weeks or six weeks and you'll become a global citizen. You know, that, that's not, that's not accurate, right? We, we don't create global citizens through a four week or six week study abroad experience. I think if we offer a spectrum of, let's call them international education opportunities or experiences, maybe the first one you do in your first semester as a first year student on a campus and you've never traveled abroad before, but you take part in a one credit mini course that's similar to what your students did earlier this week, Alexis, or was it today? They did the walking, virtual walking tour of Athens. Maybe that's a first experience, but institutions need to be clear about what the goals and outcomes are for that. You know, it's not equivalent to the in-person education abroad experience. There are differences. And here again, I don't see this so much as a problem, but as an opportunity. In fact, I think, uh, having this conversation points to the fact that education abroad has been successful over the last 50 years of uh, establishing itself as an important, legitimate, even essential academic offering on campuses. And so now the opportunity is to offer different iterations of that, uh, different uh, forms that can lead to the longer term in-person kind of experience that we'd like as many students as possible to have. So it, it does, again, open up different possibilities for us. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't see other questions in the chat, but I'd like to um, pick up on something very quickly. The flexibility of students to which you made reference. Um, certainly those when I was teaching last spring during the initial pandemic um, shutdown, and I think many of us found, and you made reference to this as it relates to international education, our students are much more flexible than uh, we and the professor and are. Um, we've been doing things the same way forever. And our students really have some clever ways um, and, and thoughts about how to better deliver the product, including international education. Um, you know, I taught my language courses, courses of course, remotely last spring. Um, and the best ways, best practices were really developed in collaboration with the students. And so um, you mentioned also students are managing their, their credentials um, and this kind of thing. So students really, this well, rather than a problem, this is an opportunity and COVID has sped it up to, to rethink higher education um, and really to make it a lot better. Let's stop with that. Yeah, I, I think so. I've been so impressed by the stories of students who uh, have been able to figure out uh, what they want to do and ways to keep actively learning. Maybe it's uh, to volunteer, you know, engage in some volunteer work, which they can do online or some other new direction uh, during this pandemic. And uh, they're very resilient, very adaptive. And this was happening already, you know, this idea of personalized learning, a more learner-centered approach. Some of it incorporates artificial intelligence, of course, you know, to kind of customize things to, for training and skill development in individuals. But within the university, you know, I think we may get used to the idea of 
rather than thinking of fitting students into programs. You know, here are the programs we offer, you fit into them. Uh, we may get used to the idea of a student co-constructing their program. Obviously, some of our institutions already do this. You know, we, we have examples. Uh, I think Brown University maybe is a good example of an institution that has, you know, that opportunity for students to construct their, their curriculum and degree plan. But um, it, it, I think will become a more common kind of feature of our campuses. And then the question is how might education abroad adapt to that? Now for a program like CYA, I would say is extremely well positioned because it already gives students very good guidance, personal uh, kind of counseling, advisement, um, learning, helping to shape the individual's learning and so on. So I, I think, you know, CYA, will uh, approach this from a position of strength. Thank you. Um, we've reached the top of the hour, so let me kick this back to Alexis, please. Brian, um, Hal, thank you very, very much for this very informative and thought-provoking session uh, and all the good words you said about CYA, uh, both of you. Um, uh, let me let me just uh, mention that uh, you said um, you said Brian that uh, we had this uh, walk uh, this virtual walk in Athens for our um, for our students uh, from one of our, by one of our um, archaeologists and expert um, topographers here and uh, I just want to make make it understood that these are <clears throat> this was a walk. A virtual walk for 30 students who are already in Athens and, and they're, they're, uh, they just arrived two days ago. They're all quarantined for a week and then um, they're going to be in severe lockdown for the next uh, three weeks. So uh, that's a challenge. Um, now, I, I, I want to say that uh, I, I, I no took notice of uh, your uh, pointers such as uh, uh, things that CYA could do, you know, uh, in the future, like uh, uh, courses for corporate, corporate groups and uh, uh, adult programs. Uh, these are interesting uh, prospects. And also your, uh, your comment about uh, team taught courses uh, on, uh, on, 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 on a global scale uh, uh, discussing global issues such as uh, migration um, uh, uh, and, and, and the environment uh, and nationalism, populism, and uh, all the things that are uh, affecting us these days. These are good ideas and we will pursue them. Um, let me only say that uh, this this past year we have been um, uh, working on uh, launching a, a gap program for young students who don't want to college go, want to go to college for because of the uh, pandemic. And uh, except for the gap program, we also uh, 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 launched uh, a, an internship, like a virtual internship program, which is already underway and has a few students. So. Things are, are, are beside, in, in spite of the uh, pandemic, are uh, moving along. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, say to our audience that um, in March, uh, CYA will return uh, with uh, something very special again uh, a, a Zoom lecture celebrating uh, Greece's uh, uh, 200th anniversary of the Greek War of Independence. This will be an event co-hosted uh, by the Greek Embassy in Washington, uh, the uh, Consulate uh, General of uh, Greece in Boston, and CYA. It will be the three of us. I think we are going to um, have a great event, particularly because our speaker will be um, uh, 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 Mark Mazaur, uh, well-known, renowned uh, British historian and professor at Columbia. Uh, serving as the discussant will be uh, Nicola Prevelakis, the assistant director of cultural uh, of curricular development at Harvard. 
uh, at Harvard's University, um, the Harvard University Center for Hellenic Studies, and also a lecturer uh, on social studies. So we hope you can join us for this uh, uh, celebratory event on the 3rd of March. Thank you again. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, uh, Hal. And uh, we hope to see you all in three weeks. Take care. Bye-bye.